I'm gonna have chat here in case you want to send me links and stuff. What you're listening to is, um... This weird, like, I had the show last month or so. And, um... It's like a compilation of a bunch of unreleased stuff. Hey, we're doing good. Nice. All right, yeah, I can't even hear audio from the stream. So I'm not gonna wear headphones. So, we got great level. We got great EQ. Thanks to Robert D. He's got the power of, huh? He said that's right, baby. Doing that weird gate cutoff thing on one channel only, though. I don't know what that means, but we'll figure it out. I don't know. How about now? Because this is this is what he's talking about. It's something to do with my voice. I think it might have to do with like the mic just not being in my mouth. Um, I could be wrong. I often am wrong, actually. Um, so welcome back to a little help. Um, we're I don't know branching back to branch out, you know, in order to explore more parts of the tree. If I were a squirrel, um, which I'm not. But I would have to, you know, run or jump back to a larger branch in order to explore uh, further up or, you know, lateral or something, the trunk. Um, same as ever, we're going to rock it with Ableton Vanilla. Abel Vanilla. I was trying to come up with like a, some kind of weird default live thing. Um, and as we go through, I've been kind of adding stuff anyway. No, I'm just kidding. Adding shortcut keys. Stuff that I normally do just to speed up our workflow. So I press Control K. Or this cool little key button up here. You can see all these default mappings we got. Which are, there aren't any. Um, so let's kind of start there. Welcome, welcome. Team Ad. Elise Epsilon, Zacharonian Cheese, Took Art. I saw your stream earlier. I don't know who else is here. I got chat working though in front of me. You can't see, I mean, you can see it. Chat shows up over there. Uh, score Max Boy. Our tournament went really well. A Torque. I knew it was you. Uh, Kinethic. And uh, all of them. Welcome so much. Um, well, yeah, this is uh, what default Ableton looks like. It has like a reverb and a delay, just kind of kicking it. A couple audio tracks, a couple MIDI tracks. Um, I think I've installed all of the default patches, though I could be wrong. Uh, let me check my uh, downloads really rapidly. Basically what I'm doing is like, oh, Vinyl Classics, is that in here? Yes. Okay. Unnatural Selection, yes. The Forge, yes. Sound Objects Light, yes. Session Drums, Multimic, and Studio. Session Drum Studio is not installed. So yeah, just kind of grabbing all the stuff off of the Ableton website. We're going to do sound design-y type things. We're going to do stuff. Um, I want to get into Max for Life. I haven't found like a really good guiding resource in order to come up with a structure. Um, because I don't know anything about Max for Life. Like, I know very, very little. I know you can link different types of control signals, like... Uh, an audio signal and a control signal, like you would in, I think it's called Reactor, which I also have, but only slightly more experience in. Max for Live has a bunch of Ableton like uh, functions built into it, and so you can actually do things that modify the software itself, uh, sort of. I mean, scripted behavior. So focused, didn't see the messages until we left. It's okay, it's a good stream. If you guys aren't watching Too Hard Stream, you can check out our Discord, um, where we have a lot of people, a lot of creatives in our, in our community. Also, if you're in our Discord and you just want, like, your stream shouted out, that would be cool. Um, come to our Discord, uh, let one of the moderators know. Uh, that would be, like, Angry Crow or Mint Potion, or probably Angry Crow or Mint Potion. And what you'll want to do is... Let us know that you're cre streaming something creative. Like, link us to one of your streams. Um, and we will get your butt um, in our little Plug Zone channel. 
Why not? Especially if you're making cool stuff. Like Zacharoni and Cheese, making cool stuff. Team Ad 40 Blue, making cool stuff. Two Cart, making cool stuff. Me, installing a bunch of samples. And I can kind of double check as we go here. So, Session Drum Studio is in there. Samplification... All of the M4L, Plugo Granulator, blah, 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 blah. Max for Live Essentials, yes. Uh, building tools, yes. Big three, yes. Loop masters, mixtape, yes. Concrete breaks, yes. Guitar and bass, I think we messed with that last week and made a stupid sounding track. And so I think, now that that's installed, I can actually delete all of this crap permanently. Oh, hard drive space, represent, represent. Um, tonight we've got a bunch of cool stuff going on with you. <clears throat> um, so I don't know why Torek wants me to stop but these are all things if you have live suite you can grab like basically these are the sample packs that come with Ableton um, I think do I have like retro synths or something like that that's a free one there are a couple of these as well that are available on Ableton.com um, but to get back to the thing so each section of this software has these little triangles in the bottom left. There's this help review, right? And as you, you know, mouse over things, it'll tell you what that stuff is. That'll help you get through, I guess, like the top, top, tip top level of the manual, right? Um, just to get a sense of what the heck does that button do? Um, and you can open and close all of these panels like so. Show and hide the detail view, the bottom area of the screen, uh, where we can view clip and... Um, effect chains. It's called the detail view, so I can show and hide it by clicking this guy. Or heck, I can show and hide the browser view over here. So that's this guy. And of course, the help view can get the heck out of the way for you. Um, when we are dealing with different tracks, we're going to need instruments or samples to fill out a MIDI track, and audio is going to require clips. No clips are selected. Um, if this has ever happened to you, where like these, these large like borders are pretty scalable, right? I can make my browser huge, I can make my detail panel huge. It's kind of like an inspector view in Unity or like a Cubase. Um, the that's, that's fine. Um, some people prefer having like focus on like if I was to make a MIDI clip, like let's right click and insert a MIDI clip. You know, now if something shows up in my detail view, hey, all right. And some people prefer to work with MIDI like this full piano roll. Um, toward the edges of a lot of these panels or these these different views, the mouse will switch. Uh, types. So like it's a selection kind of thing right now. It's a, just a regular old pointer. And then as I go up into this division, it turns into a play button. Like, it, you know, it'll play from the start of the clip. Right. Next one up will change the looping region that we're working with. Right. So it turns to like the left, right arrow thing. And the top one is the zoom view. And it is kind of uncommon. Uh, at least, like, the feel of this zoom, because normally there's, like, you know, control scrolling and all that kind of stuff to, that are, uh, like, that you would do in, like, I don't know, some other kind of software. Those same rules apply in this view. So this is session view, um, where you can make arrangements of clips vertically um, and kind of play through each, like, line over here. What I'm doing is hitting the enter key. You can also click the play button. You can also do more stuff here. I'm not sure. Um, Ator, let me know if I'm going too fast. I'm kind of trying to avoid audio stuff at the moment. We've actually done this in super, super early pilot episodes of this exact show. But I can uh, play up here. I can stop. I can record. Um, I can add what's called overdub MIDI, right? Add arrangement overdub. Useful. Very useful. This is linking automation or arming automation. Re-enable automation in case we make an adjustment. Um, 
that to like overridden automation. It's kind of weird. Because uh, you will disable automation if you have it written and you're like tweaking it. Uh, but we'll get, we're not even talking about automation. That's just the thing. Um, so each track, these uh, columns are called tracks. And uh, each track, whether it's a MIDI or an audio track, has a certain set of, uh, I guess, configurations and uh, parameters. All of these are actually visible over here. So in this bottom right section, there are a bunch of these dots, right? And um, we can enable a crossfader and assign audio tracks or MIDI tracks, if they make sound, um, to either an A or B. And then I can crossfade between those A and B tracks, right? Not unlike Serato DJ. If you want to do a super hot mixtape, this is how you do it. If I don't want either track to be affected by the crossfader, I can just toggle that button off and we're good to go. Uh, next is track delay. And you can add a pre or post delay in milliseconds or samples if you click on this button. Um, in order to do more detailed positioning of audio, um, it's good if you kind of want to program swing across an entire track. Like I just want all of my whatever hi-hats. I want to draw them on the grid, but I want them to be delayed. I guess we can demonstrate that. Next is the M, the mix information. Show me the mixer section. Um, mixer section shows you the peak level of a track. We can adjust the volume by dragging this fader here. If I want to change or restore the original value of a, a parameter in Ableton, I can press backspace, um, or I guess delete on Mac. Um, and that will put a fader or a knob, like this is for volume, this is panning left and right. Uh, I can just press backspace to reset that. It's a very useful default kind of key. Um, here we have woo, the channel mute, these guys. I'm pressing the function keys um, to toggle them because by default, the first eight channels, uh, if I were to make a bunch more audio tracks, which you can do by pressing control T as I just did, or you can right click and insert an audio track, a MIDI track, or a return track. Hey, all right. So I'm gonna do control T. So F1, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are all like hotkeys for muting your first like group of audio, right? This is just pure interface stuff. You can also press the button. Um, you can solo each track by clicking on that. When you solo a track, it'll focus down onto that one track, right? And unsoloing will unsolo all. If I want to solo multiple tracks, I can press shift, or sorry, control. And that will allow, allow solo to be non-exclusive. If I unsolo one of those tracks, then they all go unsoloed. I can also manipulate multiple tracks by holding shift and doing this. So now you can see tracks 4 through 8 are selected and I can actually move the volume and I can disable and solo and arm. Check that out. I can't arm all of the tracks. Interesting. So that's actually a setting. Um, by default Ableton will not uh, give you the select, or it's called an exclusive arm and mute. And you can choose in the preferences which I ought to by pressing command comma or going up here to I think edit uh, references or file or something like that. Where do they move this to? Hold on a sec. I'm curious. Preference is so important. Actually, it is pretty important. References is where you're going to be changing your, um, like what we did with our display zoom to make the stream a little bit more legible for y'all. Um, here we go. Allow sleep mode. We can see what these options actually are by having our, this side, uh, over here, the help view open. So avoiding issues with problematic audio and MIDI drivers. Um, let's see. Multiple instances of Ableton to be allowed. Uh, permanent scrub areas. Where is record, warp, and launch? So I can choose whether or not armor, solar, or exclusive. 
if solo and arm are not exclusive, then I can arm multiple tracks for recording. Um, and that is quite good. I don't actually have my uh, input configured, so these are not going to show up properly. Um, and we would do that in this setting. Like, they're not going to turn red, as you would expect maybe a record button to, to be. But I do not have with this audio setup, because I'm playing through a television or to our stream system, um, we don't have a mic setup or audio interface right now on this system. I mean, there is one here, but we're not using it. <clears throat> Obvious reasons. Um, but you can enable input here, and that'll allow your audio recording um, through a microphone or instruments or other line level um, signal. Go right into Ableton. But it's easier to enable multi-track recording by those means. There is a feature to not make Ableton play automatically when you hit record. These are all just little preferences. Some people prefer selective arm and mute. Or arm and solo. Some people don't. Um, so there are options for update rates, uh, whether I want to see, oh, show me the automation in any track that I'm changing the automation on is useful for if you have multiple MIDI channels that are pointing to multiple tracks. And I think if we have like a good baseline controller, I can demonstrate using MIDI channels across a bunch of different tracks. Instead of just focusing one down, you might have a bunch of different people playing, let's say, a dozen different keyboards are plugged into your computer um, you can certainly support that assign a MIDI channel to an instrument assign that you know in, that controller to that MIDI channel and you can have one guy playing the organ and you know one girl playing a synthesizer totally beautiful um, which is actually something that I that's pretty rare I don't see that very often in like music production culture it's a pretty decent collaborative tool. A lot of these tools are, and a lot of people... What? Hey, Zacaroni and Cheese, thank you so much for visiting. The stream's going well. I think it's great to see you. You, you have good time on your stream too, man. <clears throat> I'm just really rapidly running things down for Atoric, and please stop me if you have questions. I am very attentive to the chat. Um, let's see. <clears throat> So the master track is pretty special. Oh, but we were going through mixer settings and options. All of these, by the way, are mirrored in, mirrored in these two modes or ways of viewing. There's session view, which is vertical, and arrangement view, which is more traditional, horizontal. Um, you might see, after you try recording something in session view, that your lanes are grayed out compared to like if I had a new audio track that had no information on it, right? There are these buttons here that actually mean to go back to the arrangement. So you can set all tracks to go back to arrangement, which means that the version that you're hearing is the version that is according to this timeline, like the, the file according to this timeline, as opposed to the, the state of this session view. <clears throat> um, actually, you'd normally map that to a hotkey in both views. And so mapping keys, we'll start there because you can get away with a lot. And I tend to, you know, it's like if you, there are people like the, a lot of the branding for, let's say the Ableton push, right? Controller for the software is to get away from your computer. But look at this thing. Look at how many keys, look how many keys you have to work with. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, it does some stuff automatically, right? We know that F1 through 8 are going to arm and, you know, or mute and unmute different channels okay um by default f9 will record f10 i don't know what f10 does but f9 arms record f10 makes me look stupid um f11 goes full screen that's useful all right f12 looks like it's toggling between these two views here the clip view and the device view all right, so maybe we should talk a little bit about the difference between these two views. Now, we can see our little helper guy 
our clip view is either going to show us information about an audio track or an audio file. Like if I have a sample, there's like a hi hat sound, right? I can see information about that clip. Sounds like that. Um, here, if I press F12, I have this other thing um, where I can put in audio effects. Oh, wonderful. Let's get something simple. There are quite a few effects. There's a wonderful channel called Cloud, Cloud Sign where the guy has a bunch of what are called uh, RTFM tutorials. And essentially the dude reads the manual. You can also read the manual. In Ableton you can find the manual. Whoa! Sorry, I have to press F11 again. Um, you can read the live manual from the help menu. <laughs> and um, it's actually way dense. Uh, our dude, if you saw our tournament, uh, we have an intern, Cameron. He has a physical copy of the manual because he bought the Ableton 9 box. And it's several, I'd say it's like two or 3,000 pages long. Like it's a heavy thing. So, you know, save the environment and uh, get the digital version. What I've done here is place an effect. Pressing F12 to tab over. What? That's crazy. There's another way to do that, which I actually use way more often. Um, and I also need to demonstrate. So that'll make a sound, right? This is way too quiet for my taste. So we have a rhythmic, simple delay here. Um, it'll repeat on the fourth and sixth beat. Fourth in the, right, in the left channel and the sixth beat in the right channel. If you don't believe me, listen to that metronome. Up here is the metronome. And a couple of, like, I'd say, like, song-wide options. And then, like, arrangement. Like, it's not really options. It's kind of it's kinda weird. But menu for quantization, like, when our events are triggered, right? Global quantization. Um, I have a metronome that offers us a count -in. We can also edit maps here. We can change our time signature if you're feeling crazy. Tempo nudge up and down is pretty cool. But it's going to be a little bit hard to demonstrate um, nudging. We're going to have to do that in a live session with someone. Maybe Brian Burwell. Maybe Sam Lustig. If I ever see him again. I miss you, Sam. I hope you're well. Uh, tempo and tap tempo. So tap tempo is neat. Right? You know, it'll measure the interval between these beats and um, give us a little bit of something. Volume's a little bit low over here, so I'm gonna adjust that the same way I would anywhere else. And if you don't believe that timer, listen to that metronome. Subdivisions in time. I don't wanna get into too much detail with the simple delay yet, because we're just doing top level stuff. We can take a sound from our browser, there are a lot of ways to browse sounds in Live 9. They've really improved this section. Um, we can preview sounds over here. Oh, yeah. And maybe let's say you're listening to your song and you don't want your preview to mess with your head too much, right? If you come across a sound that's very, like, I don't know, weird. This is a cool song, though. I can adjust the volume over here, this blue bar. Uh, this blue fader is the volume of your Q channel. So, oh, I can't really do that at the same time. Well, I'll just do it twice. So here's really, really low Q, right? If I turn that up, here's really, really normal Q. Pretty useful. You can actually set. Uh, which Q output and which master output you have. So, for example, if you're working in a DJ booth, you're going to have volume that goes out, you know, to the house sound system, and volume for you to monitor maybe the next track that you're queuing up um, that other people can't hear. Or let's say, you know, you can have that set to, if you have an audio interface that supports it. Like, I want sound to go to one channel. Uh, let's maybe, this is going to, Totally narrow down our stereo image, but you know, have some faith. Where's my hi hat at? Yeah, where's my snare? <clears throat> so the metronome should be coming out of one channel, and the hi hat is going to bounce a bit, or it's going to mix both. 
but we can still send audio to different channels. Depending on your audio interface, number of inputs and outputs you have, it's here that we can change those output settings. If we configure this, it'll show us, oh, did you know that you can have one and two with mono as options or one and two stereo? If I have multiple outputs, I can drive multiple speakers and therefore, hey, offer up maybe a Q-mix in one specific direction. The Ableton Mono, yes, exactly. I did that on purpose, Hey, That's right. So depending on your audio configuration and what hardware you have, you know, the software is designed to interface with that in a very, you know, customizable way. And that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. So we've demonstrated clips and effects. It takes a little bit more work than just dropping a sound in. Um, but I kind of want to work my way back through the mixer and talk about a couple of more features. So first are effect sends, right? As we work our way up this mixer view. The next little dot here is sends. Sends A and B. And A and B, we might have seen earlier next to the master channel. It was a reverb <clears throat> and a delay return. Um, next to the S button is an R button. And I can show and hide my return tracks as well. You know, so they don't get in the way. Totally reasonable. So, <laughs> let's see. We're going to um, do these. We look at the, by default, we have these reverb settings, right? And this is just a plugin that is in Ableton in our audio effects section of the browser. Um, we can browse for audio effects, MIDI effects. I really want to take my time getting to MIDI because it's actually a lot of cool stuff that you can do there. Audio a little bit more flexible. There's a lot of, I guess, obvious like things you can do with audio. Uh, I need something that kind of, I need something kind of groovy. What if I search for loop? So in the top section of this browser, I can search. I can also press control F for my cursor to go there. And that's why I want to find something like a loop. All right, cool. Um, you're great. So I can't drag that to a MIDI track and get what I expect. I mean, I can. It'll just turn that MIDI track into an audio track. I can also convert. If I right click, I can slice to a new MIDI track and convert. Like I said, MIDI has a lot of stuff going. I can show where that is inside of the browser. And since it's installed in the software or registered in the software, I'm not going to be able to find it in Explorer. However, if I were looking for things that I've added to Ableton, I can show my user library in Explorer. It's over here. All right. So if I'm playing clips from here, let me get that mixer back. You've done your job, metronome. I believe in you. I got my clip view and you'll notice that, oh, by the way, I press tab in order to switch between these two views. So I can click these buttons, which I'm sure is neat for like a really, really big touch screen. But my hi-hat over here. Can I hear it? No, because we haven't gone back to arrangement on this track. So the question is, can we hear it if I am looping in the other screen? And the answer is probably. Anytime. Cool. So you can actually, point of this is that you can work with these two views together. Like the software is kind of meant for that. And I think that there is a strong separation about the two. Like, oh, I can't work in one. I don't understand the other. Um, we're going to get into how to make both work to your advantage. Uh, cool. So I'm hitting tab. I tab a lot between things. Uh, a tab between programs, right? A tab between whatever the crap that is. Um, <laughs> but one thing that's useful when it comes to tabbing, if I hit just tab, I'll switch between session view and arrangement view. And if I hit shift and then tab, blam, then I can switch between this detail view and this clip view, right? So this is the last clip I was looking at. Hey, clip, what's up? All right, and you don't have any effects on you. There's no clips in this view. 
But I do have that delay effect down here. Look at you, you're so cute. Cool. So there are a lot of things that Ableton does, you know, hit space to play. Great job. But I don't want that to happen. So if I hit play on one of these, I think it's a scene they're called. Scene launch. Yeah. So each row in session view is called a scene. Which is pretty useful. Sort of. But you'll see, once again, I have this play button. None of these things are actually mapped. Boo. Um, so let's talk about mapping, right? Because in order to really get from your mind into the software as fast as possible, we have to do like a lot of different things. And depending on what you want to work with, like I said, flexibility, accessibility, that's kind of the stuff. I like that all of these panels are pretty flexible, unless you're in effect view, but that's because the effects have this little design and they're all compact and whatever. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I guess finally, in and out. But we've already kind of covered that on the other side. We can route MIDI to different channels from different channels. We can route audio to different channels from different channels. And we can send that audio to these sends. Oh, that's right. I guess that's important. Let's stop there. So I have this here, audio going to sends maybe instead of master. By default, it'll go to here. But I can also send audio to this channel. For no reason. I mean, there there could be a good reason for it. We're not going to get into why, but it's, you know, for the sake of flexibility. How about we just send it to sends? No. Sends only. So, there isn't anything coming from my sends. That's, some, that's, that's not fun. I have a reverb and a delay. Where's my reverb and delay? My A is here. My B is there. You can add more, sure. If I add, like, another return track. What's the deal? So maybe if I send it to C. Yeah. All right. But maybe I want to start using this reverb now. So we'll send some of that signal to A. All right. What kind of delay is on this track? Oh, let's make some changes. I'm going to link these two channels and give it a really, like, annoying delay. And send that to B. All right. So now I've sent signals to these return tracks, right? I send to an effect, it returns a signal. And I can either mix by having a dry chain, like I do in C, that doesn't have any effects. Or I can send it to master and I can actually choose whether or not these effects happen pre or post fader um, so to the right here do 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 this is all post mix that means that the master is going to is going to sum the affected signal after the mixer and this is before if you don't believe me ask your little help dude if so <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm just kind of uh, walking it back. Itorok was talking to me about like getting into Ableton. And so I'm like, you know, I'm going to take my time and just do some stuff. Show him the buttons. Also, also, Robbie wants to know more about it. So I figured I could make a video for him. You know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so pre-post toggle. Well, if set to post or pre, returns the track. Uh, using the clap, the clips assigned signal pre fader or post fader, right? We can actually change whether and like what order that signal is sent in. Um, mm -mm, useful to some, but there are a lot of options for. Oh yeah, well I want to send this much signal, but I don't want that much delay to come back. Fair. Basically that has to do with, am I sending my reverb signal to this delay chain, right? Like you can kind of determine a little bit of the order. It's not particularly deep, but there are other options for 
choosing the order of what your, what signal gets processed when. If I scale this down, you can see it switches from these nice little knobs to these okay smaller knobs. They're okay. All right. I can hit space to stop. And um, that's like a, a pretty big setup intro audio like overview. You know, we need clips. We need to be able to record audio into this thing and make our own clips and then make arrangements of those clips. I can take these clips from one view and drop them right into this other view, right? I need to get back to the automation so that I can open up with my fat hi-hat hit zooming around using this box, much in the way that we would inspect a clip, right? If I drag up and down, I can zoom in. And if I drag left and right, I can pan around. It's pretty good. Also, it's kind of based on the position of your mouse, right? So dragging isn't just going to put you anywhere. I can click over here, and it'll give me that area, right? Um, same thing here. I'm going to click over here and zoom in on this area. Or hey, what if I had to pan over to it? So managing that and getting around quickly will help out a lot when you're trying to do detailed stuff like play this fat hi-hat hit. Oh, all right. So this is, the, this is just the beginning. Arrangement View has a couple of other neat tricks up its sleeve, right? This is where you're going to see the full length of the song. Across the top, I can see the measure, right? I don't know what show all means. I guess it shows me all the time in the song. There's an interesting bug about that. I'm not going to talk about it. We don't talk about it. Um, on the bottom, I can see how many seconds long this song is right now. You know? We're talking about 18 and change. Fine. Some people don't call it a song until you're 3 minutes and 30 seconds in, so what you might do in that stage is make yourself, I don't know, it's about 80 measures, right? And here's our marker at, uh, here we go, 3.30 something. That's a thing. The time ruler. You can change how the time ruler is displayed by right-clicking it. So if you're scoring maybe like a video or um, a film, right, you can change the frame rate. That's pretty cool. Um, whether or not you want to account for drop frames, um, whether you want to... Usually YouTube videos are kind of like... Internet videos are 30 frames per second. That's the way of the West. Uh, the way of the East is PAL, 25 frames per second, because, you know, math is a little bit easier if you use rounder numbers. 24, because it's double the threshold for the illusion of motion and, you know, has a certain feel to it. But we're not here to talk about why people make videos and stuff. That's just an option. You can also add videos to Ableton. But unless you're running 32-bit live, I really don't recommend it. Um, they haven't really nailed it down, and it's probably better to use external tools. What we use at the studio is something called MTC Video Slave and a combination of a MIDI timecode exporter. It's so good. Like, if you think that your computer cannot score a video, you are wrong. Um, it actually doesn't take much work at all. This software is a little bit specialty. And if you're doing that kind of stuff, I'm sure it pays for itself. It's really, it's not that expensive. <clears throat> uh, well, let's see. I guess we can record one thing. Another thing that's really cool about having this flexibility is grouping, you know? I can group tracks. So if I select, let's say I put these two tracks together, I can rearrange them. They keep their numbering, which is convenient. Um, we can rename them by, holding, by hitting Control R or by right clicking and pressing the rename. I really like software that lets you know the hotkey as you go because then you could just remember that if you're that kind of guy. Um, I'm going to call this one Guy. And I'm going to call this one uh, Hat, I guess. We'll do that. Hey, no, that's not a hat. My bad. What? I'm just messing up. I wanted to put hat so that I can put hat on top of the guy, right? 
And I can put, you know, so I can reorder, rearrange tracks as all that demonstration is. If I select both of these tracks and right click, I can group those tracks. And grouping tracks behaves much in the same way that like a return track does, right? I can actually send a group to a return. So a lot of people will use groups instead of, uh, I guess what would normally be considered a bus, but that's kind of like those patches and that kind of mentality. Uh, makes a lot more sense when you have a lot of outboard gear and you need to route signals through it. Some things go through some devices, other things go through other devices. And if you've ever seen just like a confusing array of holes with cables sticking out of them and no cool knobs that make noises like a modular synthesizer, you're probably <laughs> you're probably looking at a patch bay. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about this group. It's the hack guy group it could be anything it's a hack guy group that processes audio um if i solo this group it's gonna sound the same i can listen to elements within the group totally fine that non-exclusive rule is allowing me to just kind of select everything as i go neat um but how about I put an effect across both of these things without actually affecting the channels themselves, right? If I want this guy to have nothing, that guy to have his delay, and both of them to have, I don't know, a phaser or something ridiculous. Flanger, what you got? Sweet. Neat. Right on. So we are, um, we can affect anything that's inside of a group uh, with this kind of like master effect. And to that end, right, um, all of those groups um, signals go up to master. This guy down here. So master doesn't have a clip view. Because you can't drop clips on the master. We can do a couple of interesting things like automate uh, the crossfader. We can automate like the total track panning, volume, tempo, um, the global groove amount. There's another thing that I very rarely see. We didn't even really talk about grooves. It's kind of a hidden button. Uh, if you know where it is, don't cheat and let people ask the question. Because we'll get to grooves when we get into MIDI. Um, <clears throat> But the master track ba -ba -ba -ba, needs audio effects. Audio effects we have in the audio effects section of the browser. First thing that I generally do is just like a good general rule is put a limiter either on the track or in the effects section of the track. Um, just to keep your speakers or your friend's speakers from popping. Uh, you can tell when your track is clipping. When your meter turns red. Right now it's not. Please cover your ears as I add a couple more decibels. Oh, just kidding. That's not how it works. So a limiter is going to stop that gain from becoming a problem. Um, another good way to introduce a problem, just to demonstrate it really, let me mute this. I'll turn up the volume of the master track. And you can see that all of these indicators here, my Q, my out, are a little bit too red for my liking. I mean, I like red just fine. But that's not what we want. So the signal coming into the master, it's going to go through the effects on that chain, and then the master level is going to be here. Which means you can overblow your signal, but you should manage the various stages at which we are changing and increasing the volume of our tracks before we even get to the master it is useful if you want to do like general like a fade out type of thing uh or fade in like very large dynamics that affect every single track just remember everything gets summed up or added together at this point a lot of you might already know all that stuff so thank you for bearing how about that audio back all right So this is neat, but if I'm working on a section of the song, especially like I don't dig all that, you know, let me just turn the mix of that effect down. All right. So 
what I might want to do is focus on this drum loop for a minute. Because every time it plays through, it just kind of runs out. You know, and it has like a certain quality to it that is neat. If I look at the clip's properties, so I can double click the clip. I see that it loops over here in this like sample region. I can see that it's a warped clip. It's plain in time. A lot of Ableton's pre-existing samples are already warped so that they will match your tempo when you drag them into the project. We'll get into that later, if you have that question. Um, but not super necessary. What I'm curious about right now is, okay, this loops, right? But how do I loop it? Now I got a couple of options, right? This is what, a four bar loop? Cool. Why don't we uh, maybe on the right side of the clip, drag it out. And you can see this like little indentation right there. We like to call it the butt crack. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that will be indicating a loop. We're playing the same four bar section twice. If I change the length of the loop, you can see many, many, many more of those subdivisions. Eh, it's not a huge deal, but a cool thing. Um, also useful for composition, if you're into that. Um, secondarily, I need to set maybe the loop region. Can I do that by right clicking? Why, well, yes, I can. Oh, and I can also press Control L. Sweet. So what that'll allow me to do is just listen to that section. You can see that we're looping in the top right over here. Um, by let me turn this master down. By looking at this guy, this is highlighted. That means we're looping. If we're not highlighted, ah, not gonna work. And I think this is loop in and out points as well. Loops kind of have a lot of flexibility, but I can say, oh, punch in here, punch out there. Mm -mm -mm. Activate this to prevent arrangement recording prior. So we can also use the loop region to add punching out and in sections. I can change the loop region by adjusting this kind of strange orientation of numbers here, right? So on the left side of the loop uh, control, is the position of the loop. It's starting on bar four of the song. Beat one. Uh, I guess subbeat one. It's like, let's talk about, I guess, subdivisions of beats, right? So instead of saying quarter or semi or 16th or hemi or however many different distributions, we have this kind of beat addressing system, you can call it. So, I have beat one, like measure one, beat one, subdivision two. Um, it can get really detailed. You know, you can kind of keep subdividing. If you look at the bottom right of our clip view here, you can see we're looking at the grid from various different resolutions. Do 30 seconds of a beat, 128th of a beat, 256, 512, 20, 48, 40, 96, one, six, eight, three, four, and then it kind of gets into like the sample level, you know, it's, it's about double sample level. Um, what's going on here with all these power of twos, right? We just happen to be dividing each beat by two, right? I have one, I have half of a bar, I have a half of a half of a bar, and so on and so forth. Half of a half of a half of a bar. So the second beat and the first measure, the second beat of the second beat of the first measure. This is how we're going to locate ourselves in time relative to, in this case, the clip. This is measure one of the clip. This is measure four of the song. This is exactly what our locator is telling us. And that's kind of useful. We're talking about beats and bars. I want to change the length of this loop to four, because I know it loops. It's going to get to the end. It's going to start at the beginning. I'm proud of you, man. You do you. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So I need something else, all right? I need MIDI. I need some other tones. Ableton has tons of samples. And if I search, I'll find a bunch. If I look through the packs that we've installed, I'll find a bunch more. You know, some are loops like this, some are just going to be stabs or samples that we use in order to 
make a noise. Some of these noises are great. We can make Apple ringtones. This is totally true. But we have a lot of options for manipulating samples. A sample is just a clip of audio. But they I would prefer calling it a sample as opposed to a clip because a clip has a few more properties, right? In Ableton, we have a clip over here. A clip's got a name. It's got a color. It's got a time signature. It's got a groove. I'm still going to avoid grooves for now. We can even nudge the timing of that clip if we want. Instead of looking at the clip view, I could disable the clip. I can also disable the clip by right-clicking it and pressing deactivate or the letter zero. Um, there's this envelopes box which shows automation that is attached to a clip. If I were to change the volume of it over time, or heck, let's just say I want to fade into it at the beginning. And, um, uh, sorry, I'm pressing some keys. I shouldn't be pressing. Um, right here, if I show fades, control alt F, <laughs> I get this really nifty control for automatically managing the beginning and end of the volume of a clip. This is useful, and I think by default, Ableton adds a fade to your sample if you look way, 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 way deep down. Check this out. There's this thing here. There's this curve already here. I just showed a fade. What's going on? Why? What's your problem? Now, if I were to add, let's change the setting. Because for people who make beats like myself, you will find that auto creating fades on clip edges is going to lose the transient of a lot of your sounds. Um, if you have, especially just like a random sample pack, and you're like, that snare just doesn't have the same click. Uh, LZ Epsilon. This is all, I, you know, it all looks so different, but it is all very relatable, very much the same. Let me grab a drum hit to show you a different fade, for example. I mean, this is something that Ableton does to kind of keep their sound smooth. And this is one of those settings that kind of gives Ableton a sound. Um, if you don't know that your clips are being faded automatically, Give things aren't going to... I will. Give just a second. A okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> if you don't know that your, that your clips have, are being faded on, um, then you are missing out. No, uh, I really need just like a kick or something. No, I don't need all the kicks. I just need a single kick. I will. How about I look for a kick? Oh, cool. So I filtered out a bunch of kicks. Perfect. How about I drag that click into this section here? Seems normal. But notice how it's not actually starting. We'll just talk about zero crossings in a second. But the reason why Ableton doesn't show that it has these fades by default. Do, 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 do. Show fades. I've disabled that. So this is the default setting. What it does is it makes sure that if you have a sample that starts, let's say, here. That it doesn't click. And so clicking occurs when you have a sample that does not start on the zero crossing, or really close to it. Um, this is darn near. Zero crossing is this point in each sample. will have a positive or negative value, depending on the sample rate of your audio. If I look at our audio settings, we're working probably with 16-bit 44.1 waves, right? 16-bit samples. So I have a positive or negative 16-bit number which i think what is that like one six five five three six no higher i don't know it's a huge power of two that gives us dynamics right and if you start too far off that's going to tell your computer that your speaker should be a whole other different <laughs> it should be clicking basically it should move very very quickly from it's like a pulse right very very quick pulse from one side to the other it's really difficult to pick up on at first, but if you notice that, why don't my drums have 
impact, it's probably because there's a fade. You hear that click? You don't hear that click? You hear that click? Showing fades and knowing about fades is really important when working with audio. It's really important when you're working at really small scales, and it's really useful when you're working at really large scales, because without changing the contents of the actual clip itself, I can add a fade in. Whoa. Sweet. So maybe it fades in for a measure here. I got roughly this to that space. Do do do. And uh, in the middle of this curve is a little Bezier handle, which will allow me to change the curve of it, whether it's kind of more extreme on this end, or kind of more linear, or a little bit more, I don't know, I guess we're moving around the exponent, right? Uh, it's all math. It's all math. How do you want to change this thing over time? Can I make the thing linear? I don't know. But we can also reset the fade. And that's pretty default. That'll give us a relatively linear looking thing. How about I ungroup? How about I unsolo that click? So I have that. If I want to arrange samples to make a beat, which is a very, very popular way of working, I think it's because it's very visually oriented. Um, I can use these beats we were talking about, these ticks, right? Right now my grid is divided into sixteenths of a beat. Um, I can change the resolution of that beat by right-clicking in any empty space. I can choose, hey man, how about like eighth, eighth note? Or maybe like, you know, whatever distance I view that at, I'll always have an eighth note grid, an eighth of a beat. I like the adaptive grid. Somewhere between the narrow and the medium. Uh, depending on what you're comfortable with. I think that looks pretty good. And that'll allow me to snap selection. So I can copy this, like you would copy text. Copy. Paste. Right? So now I have a beat. One, two, three. Sweet. Um, maybe I want something in between here and there, right? If I pasted an audio over another audio file, then I lose that second hit. Man as cool as that is. But there is a division here. It might be kind of hard to see. So I'll change the color of this clip. This is actually the other sample. Whoa! Because we've pasted it's the same length, this and that kind of thing. In order maybe to assure that that doesn't happen again, I could select just the part of the sample that I want. Uh, let's see. And you're not even on the beat. You're close though. And I respect that. Hey, you know what else fades are good for? Crossfading, what? I'm a fan. Sweet. So I can take the fades if I can see them. Show fades. Or hide fades. Do what you gotta do. I can take fades and I can use that to splice or do like a small crossfade between the samples. Not unlike the DJ uh, would crossfade between tracks. Just within the same track. Alright, so maybe I only want a section. How about like a section about about Yay Vig? This guy. You you look good. I can paste that down in the halfway spot between these two beats. Paste. I can also duplicate by right clicking and pressing duplicate. Or I can press control D to duplicate. Whoa, that's not control D, that's control S. We're not gonna save quite yet. Um and, of course, drag that out. This, these are all references to a sample file. They're not actually what that sounds like yet. So if I do want this, which I kind of do, especially because I want to make some changes to it, I can right-click and consolidate audio once I've made a bunch of edits. And what that does is creates a new sample that has these cool properties, like the audio that we copied and pasted sticking together. Sweet. What if I add like a fade to that? Because it's there. Neat. Um, now I have created my own audio in one of a couple of different ways. We're going to, I don't know what, go at our sample settings, 
if I have an editor hooked up to my software, what's this? Oh, okay, sure. Then I can edit the sample in another tool. Audacity for life represent. Um, I'm not going to do that, but you can save that back out or export it in the same location. I can save this into the library by hitting the save button. Um, I can rename it. See, it's a process sample that we've consolidated inside of this current project. Uh, it's actually pretty, pretty good for organizing, not bad. Um, if it is a pretty big sample that uh, we need to either play back very rapidly. Um, if we have a slow disk drive, as it says, in clip RAM mode, I can just press this button and it'll move that clip from referencing my disk to referencing RAM, which is a lot faster if you've got a slow disk. Most computers do not have slow disks these days, everything being solid state. But there's also tons of RAM out there, so definitely keep that in mind. And we'll see what happens. There's tons of RAM. Let's reverse this audio file. Let's just do, there's just so much RAM. So I can hit reverse, the audio file is reversed. Um, what else can I do with an audio clip? I don't know. How about I hold Alt when I drag to make a copy instead of pressing Duplicate? That's a good idea. Or is it Control? It is Control. Sorry. Alt makes it so that you don't hold on, you don't slide to the grid, or you don't snap to the grid. Letting go is just a move tied to the grid. If I hold Control, plow. It will be tied to the grid. I think Control Alt will like make a copy and also not be on the grid or something. But you have to drag it first, so it doesn't really. Yeah. Yay! Oh, really fine. Control Z to undo, as if you were writing a really nasty email. Other sample properties include I don't know. Pick your favorite. Maybe I want to change the level of that thing, right? Like yeah. Let's make that thing a little quieter, because we're feeling a little more calm. I can retune the sample. Which has some interesting effects, because by default, when we're retuning audio traditionally, like on tape or something like that, on a record, we're changing the speed at which we're playing back the sound to detune it. So the default transposition mode, whoa, will change the actual length of that file. Wow. Really just changes the playback rate. So this really high-pitched kick versus uh, this even higher-pitched kick versus this weird, not even good enough for Paul Stretch sound. What is this? Not happening. And if you play it while moving, you can make a fart noise. Alright. Anyway. That's cool. I'm glad that we turned it down. These higher pitches seem to have more volume. Neat. How about we crossfade? Why not, guy? Sweet. Doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. There are plenty of effects, things to get into. We're just beginning to arrange our crazy beat thing. And that's just using clip controls. I mean, what if I like that part and I want maybe this next section to behave differently? Next section of our loop, right? I can split the thing. There's a couple ways to do this. I can right click, I can split. I'll find out that control E is a thing. Editing info text is also a really weird and understated um, like feature of Ableton that I think is funny. So if I right click edit info text, I can say, man, man, this is so great. I'm so glad that Ableton has this feature. It's a perfect place to hide my diary. Because I've never opened a project file. And had the help view open. And saw someone type here. I wonder if it supports HTML. 
Probably not. Let's see if I can get chat in there. Sweet. So now, when I look at this clip, it tells me stuff. Nice. Like, did you know that chat, a link to the pop-out chat on our Twitch channel, can be embedded into an audio clip? Certainly that is useful. Um, but by default, it will just tell me about what that type of object is. So, you know, there's that. But I suppose if I was, like, shipping things over, or if I had notes about, like, I don't like this section of guitar, Ravi, um, I would tell him to look at the note on the clip, but he'd have to know about that and, you know, right click everywhere he goes. And I don't want him to suffer that. So I said I want to make these two things unique, right? What I did was I split the track and now I have two identical loops of the same type. Maybe we'll uh, change the loop size a little bit. There's something a little bit off kilter. So now it's just going to play through, and it's looping that single section. And you know, I'll change the color of it, because that's what I do. I like the dark color because it makes white text. And in this theme that I'm using here, ooh, F11. This theme I'm using here actually makes it super sweet. Alright, so let's change that loop region. And start to get to what the heck I was talking about. Can we make sounds with the chat? Um, we can make sounds with the chat potentially using Max for Live. Um, and that'd be an interesting thing to explore. I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised that somebody hasn't done that already. I think Max for Live is going to definitely come after the MIDI, uh, the MIDI segment because I'm not going to pay too much mind to technique and detail of like oh you know why did you choose this synthesizer or that eq like you want it to sound better or different or not bad um it's kind of the reasoning for most things and if you're actually making music with your ears like one thing i definitely like about this view is i don't have a bunch of waveforms to look at and make judgments about like if i'm looking at if i'm listening to this It doesn't, I don't perceive it the same way. Because sure, it sounds the same. But I don't perceive it the same way if I have, I don't know, like some huge graphical equalizer over here. Uh, let's see, maybe like, let's get like an EQ8 on here, right? So this guy, it tells me all of this information about audio. Ooh, yeah. That frequency over here, it's this note. It's about that loud, you know. What's going on over here? Okay. Oh, that definitely makes a difference. But I think that when you're perceiving audio, like when you're mixing with your eyes like this. There's just a lot that you don't feel. I think it's like Photoshop. Like You feel like it should look a certain way. That curve doesn't look right. That's really extreme EQing you have there. I mean, and even taking that down into this. Let's say I turned off that. That helps. But if I was viewing the spectrum of the song, it's a lot of information. Oh yeah, oh definitely, that's music. And maybe to that end, you would prefer a different or simpler EQ. EQ3. It has a crossover frequency instead of eight knobs. I can choose the depth of that, and I can cut those objects down. Right? So I can see, oh, within this range, whatever we consider the high range, let's say anything over, I don't know, 2.5 kilohertz. Let me know if you're qu curious about kilohertz. If I have a slightly steeper or more decibels per, uh, what is the heck the word I'm looking for? It's a decibel filter. It's a stronger or a weaker filter at that crossing frequency. So if I take down the highs, 
you can see a much sharper fall off at that race at that range or i can even take that further and kind of reject most of the bands of the signal except for this mid section i can disable those gain stages altogether including the mid section and now we have nothing look at the shadow of what our signal once was let's bring it back that doesn't sound that different at all i mean i'm just adding low that crossover frequency right here this is that notch we have this is where the mid space lives between 840 maybe 500 or 3000 and if you don't believe me that 3.02 kilohertz is the same as 300 and, or 3020 hertz how about i type it in for you 3020 that's right with a lot of features in ableton you can double click and type in values um decibels that's a pretty valuable thing to understand how about that notch uh by notch i mean the shape in between these two frequencies high and low i can move that out like i only want the really lows and the really highs in here we're talking anything below or sorry anything above 125 hertz ish we're gonna cut at this ratio right how about even steeper wow look at that look at that shelf oh, oh. all right so we're effectively making a notch out of an eq3 and it's actually pretty darn effective it's good for you or we can just turn that back on yeah we'll turn those off and now we're doing a band pass but all these things, all these different types of filters, we're just messing with an EQ. It's good stuff. It's hard to know which of these um, devices are going to have those expandable views, but more often than not, you'll see additional options next to this power on and off thing. Alright, so this is a device on and off button. I can swap out spectrum settings. Each device that I look at in Ableton's browser, whether it's an instrument, or it's an audio or MIDI effect, and in most cases a Max for Live device. It's going to have an arrow next to it. And by default, an audio effect, let's say, if I just drag this into a channel, it's going to be the default setting for that thing. Right? Right. But I have options for that thing. Like hiss and noisy and sign. And these are all presets of the same device. And if I want to make a preset for any device, I can make my adjustments. Oh yeah, that's really crunchy. It's kind of got a little bit of phasing going on. Got a couple different options. How much it moves. And if I click over here to the right of that hot swap button, I can save that and I can call it the mover it's probably a good idea whatever so that's saved good job you don't believe me ask my friend the mover all right also that's just saving it we didn't even rename it I can right click and rename it to no seriously And save it out as seriously. Because I'm serious. I wonder what the uh, like parts of a preset, like a device preset are. Hey, you know, we've made it a certain amount of, we've made it a certain way. Let's save our work. Where's my file menu? I've gone into full screen mode. If you use software, you're familiar with the concept of Control S and Control Shift S. I'm gonna save this the normal way. Uh, I have a pre-named thing already, and that's what I'll use to name stuff that's related to a little help, like audio intro. Because I don't have time to say both audio and intro, except in a description of why I name things poorly. I have an option to uh, 
temporarily delete samples that were not or delete temporary files and I have a tendency to delete them if I'm not using them they can be found yeah if we do save them they would be in recorded it's a good place where you can keep different takes if you're uh, doing multi-track recording in the project I can also see other tracks maybe the one we worked on last week my stuff that was fun. How about I pull that track from that session file into this session? That should just work, right? No, no big deal. No, I guess I have to get smarter. Aren't you a clip? Are you the one? Can I preview this track? Did I break something? Did I hurt your feelings? How about I just drag a session file into my project? I'm a little confused right now because I think this is possible. Peace out, dude. I think Ableton is just locking up on me, honestly. What if I dragged it into this view? I know you have cliffs here. You're, you're kind. We don't take bribes from your folks all right so what would that do can we make sounds in the chat can we I'm not sure we have a couple of other strange things to examine right I mean I don't even know how long the stream has been up for I just work here man stream stats what is it called what are these things playing creative for nine viewers 1080p 30 frames a second not even 30 frames a second man one and done. Uh, tell me about your uptime. Shout out to Team Ad 40 Blue. An hour and a half already? Jeez. I gotta get ready for Brian Burwell. You gotta get ready for Brian Burwell. Did you know that Dog Tracks is coming up today? At least last I heard. Uh, don't take my word for it. <laughs> sweet, sweet vanilla. You should be able to preview these as well. I think Ableton's trying to figure itself out. Because this... There we go. Hey, I was able to drag a track from another project into this project. Yeah, tell him. So far, so good. So I pulled some MIDI from another file. And that MIDI included the patch and, I don't know, I imagine some other settings. The notes, it looks like. A couple of other MIDI files that were part of the plan. Pretty cool. That's also pretty useful if you are into sketching with live. Do you think? Uh, what else, maybe? I would like uh, maybe another MIDI track that is just vanilla. We will preview all of the things. And let me know what you want to dive into next. So I created a MIDI track by pressing Control Shift T. You could also insert a MIDI track or also press Control Shift T. Cool thing about MIDI tracks is, um, well, I guess the cool thing about defaults, customizing your thing. This is where we started, you guys. That's where we started. So I can right click many things and save them as a default preset. Save it as a preset. So if I save. This viola solo thing is a default MIDI track, and then I insert a MIDI track, it's going to be this weird viola solo thing. Interestingly enough, it doesn't save the notes, but I think it saves the instrument. Yeah. If I want to play that instrument, there's this button up here, and it toggles a QWERTY MIDI, computer MIDI keyboard. No such thing as a good name. I'm pressing keys on the board, and this little yellow light's popping up. Top right, top right, right up next to that Patreon thing that you can't see. Beautiful, beautiful. Go check this button out. Whoa. Alright. Um, I need to arm a track. And I can press A, W, S, E, D, F, G, Y, H, U, J, I... Oh, crap, I missed T. And I get, like, what's that? 15-ish notes, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
11, 12, 13, 15. That's a, that's a good good count. You can change the value of that uh, down here. Right? So if I press a Z, I can drop an octave. Or X to go up. Or I can change the velocity by pressing C and V. So I'm playing very softly. Or slightly more and more intensely. To the point where the violinist doesn't even know what they're doing. Alright. Um, and that's actually a feature that I remember from, like, I don't know, GarageBand. I don't know who else has done it. But people have done it. You can play chords. It's beautiful. Um, I guess we'll just do that. So here. Neat. And that's a one way of putting MIDI in. I've created this here MIDI thing. It's recorded the loop over the loop. So I can undo the recording or I can consolidate the MIDI file like I do with the audio to make sure that I have a full featured thing. I'm going to hide my envelope view real quick and talk a little bit more about piano rolling. I can zoom in on the left here to see, oh, look at that. Look at this mistake. Disgrace. I'm not sure that was a mistake. This is a little headphone guy. It'll allow me to hear notes. Nice. And we have this cool fifth that we're moving this middle interval around in from the minor to like that second to major to augmented. Hey, where's team at? He's around. I like to um, quantize sometimes. So you can right click and go to quantize settings to see exactly what's going to happen. That's perfect. Do your thing. Not perfect. Wonderful. There are many ways to manipulate MIDI, and that's why I don't want to talk about it today, because it goes on forever. But as long as the note on event, or the beginning of a MIDI, a MIDI note, occurs on that beat, then we'll always be able to hear it. Oh, but when it isn't, and you don't have any audio, that's why. The starting point is actually before the beat itself. Right? Oh, that's like less fun, right? Where's like my stupid cool chord part? Come on. Like I had like a interval and stuff. What's going on? Come on. So, we'll fix that. Neat. Alright, have an effect on that thing, right? It's interesting, because here's my clip view. How do I put effects on an instrument? The well, same way. With a MIDI track, I can put an instrument or an effect. Why not both? There are a lot of ways to chain and recombine things. I want something that's beautiful. Like an auto filter. An auto filter, well, it's like a filter, but it has automatic properties like movement and orientation. How long it takes for it to kick in. Um, is it oriented to a beat? Let's just change a bunch of stuff before listening to it, because that always works. Neat. So it has a little bit of motion, a little bit of life, you know. We've made ourselves a clip. It looks kind of like a melted wooden snowman. I should probably save a normal MIDI track as my default MIDI track. Just for the sake of simplicity. Let's see. And I guess the last type of device or element we would mess with I mean, like, there are MIDI effects. An arpeggiator will do what you think it does. Where I can change 
how this information is going to be interpreted by the synthesizer. Like we're processing the note data, the on and off and pitch data, and putting it into the synthesizer. And we're putting that information, or the signal that comes through, Right? That's pretty cool. And so we have a couple of different styles of this thing. Random. Oh yeah. Choice. Maybe something... Neat. Um, let's see. So you put MIDI effects before thi before instruments, you put audio effects after things that generate sounds. Pretty straightforward. Max for Live is a little bit more complex. There are max instruments, there are max audio effects, there are other max things to the max. A lot of them are what they say they are. A stutterer. What do you do? Well, I said... I love enough this other interface. It's called Max for Live. And it's a scripting interface for Ableton that doesn't play nice with that full screen mode. So we're gonna try it again. Or I don't have it installed correctly and you know that happens. Oh here it is. Are you stuttering? I don't even know what this is. I have no idea what's going on. Why aren't you making noise? I feel like you don't actually do what you say you're doing because you're not outputting any audio. Neat. Let's mix those two. I, please excuse me for a moment. Oy. What's this button do? Oh, Brian's coming up. That's cool. Chat, you're so talkative. That's what I like about you, you know? So many things to say. Alright. So, where was I? Oh yeah, so strings, right? No longer sound like strings. The couple simple effects. Uh, let's see. So you're gonna wanna save your work. You're gonna wanna know how to export audio. Um, and give live a try. I will openly admit that I had a unlimited free trial of live for years before I bought it. But I think that just puts me in the category of piracy turns into patronage. Sometimes. When you have a good thing. When you've earned it, maybe they will earn it and buy it from you. And it wasn't easy to do either because I tried to pay over like with my bank account instead of PayPal and you know, the bank was like, why are you trying to send Germany all this money? It's kind of expensive. Um, but it costs less than a car, that's for sure. Well, it costs less than most cars. Most cars that you want to drive. 
like without like you know controlling them you know with their, your phone and scooting a little dog around um but it treats time like text is how i like to think about it i can select a region i can say that's that's a good region i can copy and paste that region i can duplicate that region get that effect of that hi-hat that I love so much. That thing that started it all. Not hearing enough of that hi-hat. Where's my hi-hat? Yeah. How about something a little more intense? Yeah. How about I slide that over? So it definitely comes down to taste. Some people like to arrange their drums in MIDI. Some people like to arrange their drums with audio. Uh, there is no wrong way to do it. The wrong way to do it is not doing it. But... Maybe I have that on the three. Think, thinking about things in terms of duplicate time is super interesting. I need like a good snare. You know, to put on the two and the four. I can keep that search field the same, and I can look through sounds, or I can look through samples. I think Ableton cheats a little bit and tries to index before you search, or crash before you... There you go. What the heck? Where, where is... What is this? Stealth kick snare? It's like a whole loop. Why not? I like what you're doing with those transients. I'm giving you shorter ones. Yeah. Sounds like farts. So we can definitely get into um, LZ Epsilon. Um, we can definitely get into Reaper. We also have that. Uh, it does a lot of the same things. And this is what? 40 bucks or something like that? Pretty... F Pretty well featured, but I think for bang for your buck in terms of I have not installed anything that this software doesn't come with. Um, no sounds, no crazy effects. It comes with Max for Live, which is a whole programming language, which we aren't even talking about. We aren't even dealing with it. I'll open up like an empty Max for Live thing just to show you what I mean, because these are all programs that are written for this software. If I have a generic max MIDI effect, right? MIDI in, MIDI out, I build my MIDI effect here. What do you mean by that? Well, let's like see if I can get Max for Life to do its thing. It says Max is starting up right here. Wait, right here, right here. Look, Max is starting up. Um, I will allow access to stuff. Oh, I have a trial of Max for Live. That's useful. Welcome to Max 7. Like, seriously, man? Would you like to take a tour? Yeah. So Max 7, it makes software. It's a programming language. It's called Visual Scripting. We're going to build a very simple patch. Sweet. Let's build a patch. Click buttons A, B, C, D in order. Oh, this is a button. It outputs a bang when you click it. It'll change the panel each time you click on the green button. Oh, I see. This is a panel object. Okay. Click to produce bangs. Look, clicking random, 1001, divided by 1000, it gives me a visualization of the random value, and then it divides it down into what would be a number between 0 and 1. Sweet. Let me turn that master volume down a bit. 
I kind of like this beat though. It's not bad. Let's build a patch. A, B, C, in order. Patch will appear the box below. So, patch, what was that? C, D? Anyway, let's create a bunch of random numbers. Sweet. Okay, cool. So now I have a list of random numbers, right? And it's going to pick three of these things and send them to this output box. Okay. Left to right seems pretty normal. Boom. And now, prepend. Format the message. Or in other words, make it into something that another function can understand. And boom! Look at this! Random colors! Random colors are being generated! This is amazing! A new random color each time could also mean the same random color every time. Though it's not very likely. It can happen. So max objects, right? Involves creating boxes and connecting them together. This is what an object looks like. We get inserts at the top. It has a name. It describes what the object does. This object plays an audio sample. These are settings for that sample. And then the outlets are the resulting sounds, I guess, would come out of this one. Or information about that object, the sample itself. So what can you make with Max? Well, can we make Twitch chat actually uh, do its thing? And uh, maybe interface with Ableton in some interesting way? That's a pretty good mission. I'm kind of willing to take it on. Hit me up on the Discord or at Mint Potion TV on Twitter or uh, follow us on Facebook or check out our Patreon or send me an email. I'm Angry Crow or whatever. Get in touch. That's uh, Nix Bradley on Twitter, I guess. But let's see what Max Users created. And I'll get an idea of what Max can do. Look at this one. This is a toggle. It's like a bang. It's generating MIDI notes. I can also draw into the note table. And it tells me the order of which note is coming out. And it's actually doing something. It's sending MIDI information. So let's put an instrument there and see what the heck information that is. How about the not so annoying analog? Neat. Oh, tell him. So it's making a note between these two values and sending it to that note output. Neat. I guess it's just making a random melody based off of the scale that we're providing. This is called mouse jazz. It's not very good. Cause I can't really tell what note I'm picking. I have an X and Y coordinate thing and I assume there are what, like 12 notes ish. But I need to have like a different mentality about that. It is such a lot to take in. But I think, you know, uh, Eliza Epsilon, I think that there's definitely value. Audio, granular, synthesis. We can choose a region of a sample to play back. We can choose what sample it is. We can choose how long that grain is. I can say where that pitch starts, or if it's within a certain range. I can mute or unmute that thing, but it's not going to play out of the demo, because we're just messing with Max. Probably. So, but the same way that Ableton manipulates MIDI and audio information to generate different signals, Max for Live does that at an even deeper level. And I really think for the buck, for having a one-stop shop that like also introduces you to DSP and um, programming, um, which I think I'm really going to start digging into in this series. Did you know that this thing also does video? Too much for you? Not enough for you? Source, show me some movie file, right? Too much you or not enough you. What is the effect? It looks like I'm scaling some basketball holding person. And so this is using a library called Jitter. 
There's also randomness. And I can look at noise at different scales. And you can use this in Ableton. Getting of op getting option paralysis just from looking at it. We're just taking an overview. We're not getting deep into anything at all. I made a weird demo track. It sounds weird. And it's a demo track. Um, if you have a, you know, sensitivity to random flashing lights, watch out. Because we can actually process video data as well. Including video data from your webcam or from a file, just like an audio interface. We can make HTTP requests. Let's see what happens. What's the weather in place I can't pronounce Iceland? Oh, cool. So, chances are we can actually interface with the Twitch API using Max for Live, and I'm surprised that I haven't seen that yet. What else can we do? There are elements. There's Max. There's MSG. There's Gen. I don't even know what the heck that's about. I guess it's uh, probably a lower, even lower level algorithmic compiler. And Max for Live, which allows us to create pretty interfaces. Not like this, but like, uh, where's my weird, like, this guy? Yeah. This guy right here. Where's my beat sir? Let's see like maybe four four N. Uh uh. So we can actually create these interfaces, right? Here's what this patch looks like in Max for Live, for example. And we can take it out of presentation mode. And look, this patch actually shows how they built it. And maybe who built it, right? So, yeah, there's actually, like, a ton. I can see what you mean by uh, decision paralysis. We can modify the colors of this. We can change the properties of these elements here. Absolutely. But we can also build these things up. And I think that having all of these things in a single place versus like, oh, well, I do audio processing in pure data and I do video in uh, what's like an open source video tool set. Uh, goodness, I don't know. Blackmagic stuff is kind of open. Um, MIDI processing and Chuck or something like that. As many options as there are. Having all these things in one place, I think starts to I mean if you're going to use all of this stuff which I have honestly no experience with Max for Live um, which I think I want to use this series to dig into because I think it's super interesting um, I don't think that we're that as creatives we're getting enough out of this tool tools like Max and Pure Data and Chuck and Super Collider and Lilypad and you name it um, oftentimes are most explored for people's homework inside of university. So we're going to learn more. We can open the documentation. We can start the lessons now. I don't think we have to start the lessons now. I think what we have to do now is get ready for uh, ADD drumming, probably. So I'm going to save my work. And I'm going to come back to the lessons on Max for Live. <laughs> but that is not going to be to your purview. Because I will try and take elements from that and break that down even further into something that is pretty neat. What is this stuff? Elastic audio, fractastic sounds. Like, what are you? It's like a, it's an assignment or something? Lesson sound collage, and it shows us how to get through Max for Live and stuff. There's a bunch of cool built-in tutorial stuff. Pure Data does the same thing. Uh, do I have that installed? Of course not. Um, Maybe I do. PD extended .exe. I do. Mm -mm. That's right. There's like a lot of audio stuff out there, guys. Get ready. Get ready. We're going to insert an object. It's like the same thing. What? ADC. Welcome to GDC. So you can write code into these little things. I mean, and this is free. This is the... Actually developed by the same guy, um, but open source option. Cycling74 has kind of got control over this product. Hashtag, uh, thanks Miller Pluckett, you rock. I like this beat though. We should save our work. Anyway. 
max console. Our MIDI effect that does nothing because we've done nothing. We've just done nothing. Over the last two hours, I've shown you a lot of what you can do with Ableton. How about I get like, you know, go back to the top level, get a mastering preset in here, make it sound a little bit warmer as we head out, and get ready for the next show. I can pick an audio effect rack. We've talked about making racks. Atoric had a meeting moved right during this. Looking forward to the video on demand. Atoric, please let me know if you have questions um, and what you want me to get into. I kind of got through an overview of what the heck actually is in Ableton, which it turns out is a lot. So maybe like Overdriven Tape Master. Yeah. Oh, that's got character. Where's that reaper bet? And we'll be back. If you are interested in other stuff like reaper, we did that as well. We had a one hour competition. It is Tuesday. That means we have a one hour competition coming up tomorrow night. Get into our Discord to figure out what that's about. And we'll talk about you then. I'm not going to buy a Reaper right now. But you don't have to buy a Reaper. It's a free tool that does a lot of the same things that we went over today. And actually more. Audio software is crazy. It's been a part of computers for a long time. I could buy it later. It's actually not very expensive. I would say much cheaper. Let's turn this up though. Uh, and that's a little help you guys. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon.